Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Rucker Center for Tobacco Studies and Screen NJ, I'd like to welcome you all and thank you for joining us today for our presentation, 2022 New Year New Products, How the E-Cigarette and Tobacco Product Landscape is Changing in 2022. We're going to give a couple more minutes for folks to connect to the presentation. And in the meantime, I'd like to introduce myself and Nicolette Garth. I am a research program manager and health educator at the Rutgers Center for Tobacco Studies in Screen NJ. My colleague Nicolette, also from the Rutgers Center for Tobacco Studies, is here today ensuring all things technology run as smoothly as possible. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's presenters. Kevin Schroth is an associate professor with Rutgers Center for Tobacco Studies and Rutgers School of Public Health. He teaches public health law and his research focuses on how tobacco regulatory science can improve tobacco control policy. He previously served as an attorney with the New York City Health Department directing tobacco control policy for the city. During this tenure, Kevin played a principal role in drafting and passing more than a dozen tobacco control, control laws. He also <coughs> developed policies designed to reduce consumption of sodium and sugary beverages. Before concentrating on public health, he worked as a commercial litigator and clerked for federal and state judges in New Jersey. Dr. Julia Chen Sankey is an assistant professor at Rutgers Center for Tobacco Studies and Rutgers School of Public Health. Her research broadly involves investigating the influence of flavored tobacco use and tobacco marketing exposure among youth and youth adults as well. As, cig as cigar use disparities among racial and ethnic minority populations. Her current research involves examining the influence of e-cigarette advertising features among tobacco naive and tobacco using young adults. Dr. Mary Harivna is an assistant professor with the Rutgers Center for Tobacco Studies and Rutgers School of Public Health. Her research areas and interests include tobacco regulatory science and tobacco control policy, particularly policies that may prevent or reduce tobacco use among young people and other special populations. Dr. Harivna is the principal investigator of a contract funded by the New Jersey Department of Health intended to conduct tobacco related research and surveillance in the state including the New Jersey Youth Tobacco Survey and a repeated point of sale data collection project. Dr. Michael B. Steinberg is professor and chief in the Division of General Internal Medicine and medical director of the Rucker Center for Tobacco Studies. He maintains an active research career in the areas of tobacco treatment intervention, has published nearly 100 peer reviewed manuscripts and has conducted studies funded by NCI, NIDA, RWJ Foundation, and the New Jersey Department of Health. His ongoing efforts include coordination and training for the 10 New Jersey Tobacco Quit Centers and assisting with the Screen NJ Lung Screening Initiative. We do have a few housekeeping items to explain before we get started. Please keep microphones muted during the presentation. You may enter any questions into the chat box for our moderated question and answer session at the conclusion of all four presentations. We are recording today's webinar and we will share the recording and other presentation materials shortly. We will use polls during this presentation. Polls will be administered through Slido. The first 100 individuals to join our Slido will be able to participate in the polls. There are two ways to join the polls. You may point your smartphone at the QR code on your screen to call up the Slido website and polls, or you can log in from your device, laptop, or computer using the website and enter code 006034 to access the first poll. I'm also going to drop the Slido website into the chat for those of you that would like a place to click. So we're gonna give it just a few moments while we wait for folks to join that poll. Nicolette, are we ready? Yes, I'll advance. Excellent. Here is our first poll. What is your current professional role? You can type in more than one word for your job title. So for example, you could type in health educator. Could, so you, let's go ahead. could you give the website again, please? Sure. It is 
in the chat and I will go ahead and I will re send it to everybody out there. So we would like you to use that Slido site to go ahead and put your job title in there. So I can see everyone is working really hard to get your titles in. This is fantastic. I see uh, health educator is quite large. So that means we have a, a bunch of health educators out there on the line for, our present uh, for our presenters to know. I see some community, uh, community outreach coordinators, RNs, we have all kinds of titles out there. We have lots of healthcare professionals. We have researchers, tobacco treatment specialists are out there. Fantastic. So we're gonna give this just another moment for the hundred folks that are participating in the poll to get your titles in there. Fantastic. Nicolette, when you are ready, we can go ahead and close out this poll and we can uh, go to the second poll. And I do see folks over there in the chat also dropping in your titles. We do appreciate you doing that. Others on the line, if you'd like to do that as well, that would be perfectly fine. So we are gonna move along to our second poll. Poll number two is, name three tobacco products you have seen your patients or clients use or those in the community use. So you wanna type one product, per entry. So I see people have started entering cigarettes, hookah, jewel, vaping, fantastic. So we'll give everybody out there the opportunity to drop those product names, those product types, I mean, into the poll. And I also see folks out there in the chat dropping in products as well. This is fantastic. We really do appreciate that. I see cigarettes, vape, cigars, chew, snuff, hookah, lots of cigarettes. I see vape, vaping. I see puff bar. Fantastic. I do see uh, Jewel out there, herbal vapes, interesting. So for the presenters out there, this is a great word cloud for you to be thinking about as you go ahead and continue uh, with your presentations that will be getting started very soon. So Nicolette, when you are ready, I think we can go ahead and close that poll. I see cigarettes as the biggie, I see vapes as well, fantastic. All right, and now it is my pleasure to turn the mic over to Kevin. Kevin, you can unmute and we're happy to have you here today. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, my name is Kevin Schroth and let's get started. Uh, first off, uh, I think everyone on this, uh, in this group is pretty familiar with e-cigarettes, but uh, they are electronic nicotine delivery systems. They basically use a battery to heat uh, a liquid that usually almost always contains nicotine. Um, and there are generally other flavors and any other chemicals uh, primarily related to flavorings. It's not simply water vapor. Uh, next. We've seen e-cigarettes evolve uh, a bit over the past uh, 10 years or so. First generation e-cigarettes were generally designed to look like cigarettes, to try to mimic the cigarette experience. Um, a second generation products came shortly after and still comprise a significant uh, portion of the market. They tend, they're often called mods, or tanks, or vaporizers. They tend to be uh, first modifiable, explaining the name mods. They tend to be larger and stronger, um, more customizable, and they can uh, uh, accommodate a lot of different uh, flavors and users can uh, manipulate them in a variety of ways. Next. The third generation uh, may be one of the, the this most significant generation, especially from a public health perspective, is the Juul uh, or a third generation product. Juul is the, the was the driving force uh, in this generation that really uh, changed the landscape um, for the electronic cigarette market and the tobacco market as a whole. It was really in, in a way, one of the most radical transformations of the tobacco market in about a hundred years. Um, Juul products in particular, they used a lot of uh, catchy marketing early in their uh, uh, existence that was designed to lure in uh, younger people. Um, they, they, they borrowed some pages from the tobacco industry playbook. On top of that, they made a product that was discreet, uh, highly addictive, they used uh, a novel nicotine formulation using nicotine salts to achieve high levels of nicotine while maintaining levels of smoothness and uh, uh, low irritability. Uh, they also used a lot of flavors. Um, it is I, I would say that it's quite debatable as to whether 
uh, flavors are the, the main problem in the, uh, the explosion of youth e-cigarette use and suggest that uh, nicotine salts is probably a greater driver in that trend. Uh, next. So how are e-cigarettes regulated? Next. Uh, going back to 2009, uh, Congress passed a law that gave the FDA authority to regulate tobacco products, but it had a limited definition of tobacco products at the time, right? At that point, it only covered cigarettes, smokeless tobacco products, and, uh, and roll your own. And in 2016, seven years later, the FDA passed rules that expanded its own jurisdiction to regulate additional products, including e-cigarettes, cigars, hookah, and some other tobacco products. Next. Um, looking at the, uh, the deeming rule of 2016, uh, the FDA, by expanding its jurisdiction to cover these additional products, gave itself uh, enforcement leverage over these new products that were suddenly unauthorized. They were not authorized to be on the market, but the FDA in, uh, tried to be accommodating in its way and allowed e-cigarettes to stay on the market subject to its enforcement discretion and an upcoming process that we refer to as a PMTA process for pre-market tobacco authorization applications. Um, that's a process that's still unfolding. Uh, there have been a number of delays. Uh, I'm not gonna go through the history of it. It would take a little too much time, but there were public health uh, advocacy organizations that sued the FDA and basically said, you're going too slow. And a court ultimately agreed with them and set application deadlines that were a little bit more stringent than what the FDA had had outlined. And they set a deadline at September 9th, 2020. Um, and a lot of manufacturers of e-cigarettes primarily, but also cigars rushed to get their applications in by that date, September 9th, 2020. That put the burden on the FDA to rush through handling millions of applications that had been submitted. And the court order provided the FDA with one year to submit or to, to process all of those applications. The FDA has not processed all of those applications. Uh, next. Um, just to back up a second though, um, if you look at this chart, this shows where youth e-cigarette use was going throughout the past decade, basically. And you can see that there was a, a tick up in 2014, 2015. It declined after that. And then after 2017, there was this an enormous uh, surge in youth e-cigarette use that was characterized largely by the emergence of Juul and these nicotine salt products. Flavors and other e-cigarettes had already been on the market and had been significant parts of the market for several years. But it was only when Juul came on the market that we saw this enormous uh, surge. And in 2018, you may recall, people were really up in arms. Parents uh, against vaping were up in arms. Policymakers were seriously concerned and legitimately concerned looking at youth e-cigarette use rise. And then it rose even further before a decline. Now you can say, okay, well, it's declining, but the decline down to 19% is about the same as it was when we were in the first hair on fire period of 2018. So even though numbers have declined, they are still in a period that the former FDA commissioner described as a youth e-cigarette epidemic. So we're still in a period where there's uh, serious e-cigarette use, use and you know everyone of course is watching to see how that number is likely to uh, change. And on top of that COVID, uh, has affected patterns of behavior. So it'll be interesting to see uh, how it continues to evolve. Uh, next, <clears throat> Here, here's a picture of Scott Gottlieb. He's uh, in the news quite frequently on uh, COVID related matters, but he was the commissioner of the FDA at this time. And in 2018, when these youth e-cigarette numbers were going up, he described the FDA as being at a crossroads, a challenging crossroads because he didn't predict 
an epidemic of uh, e-cigarette use among teenagers. He points out that nicotine isn't a benign substance, especially when it comes to children and the effects on the developing brain. And on top of that, if you look at youth using e-cigarettes, a lot of them were not uh, tobacco users in the first place. Many of them were starting to use tobacco uh, because e-cigarettes were available and had become popular. And many of them probably fell into a group where they would not have become smokers in the first place. Um, as you may know, uh, cigarette use had declined quite significantly even before e-cigarettes uh, came on the market. They've continued to decline, e decline even more since then. Uh, next. Uh, so, Scott Gottlieb was ringing the alarm bell in late 2018 and, and afterwards, but then he resigned in March. And uh, in 2020, January 2020, the FDA finally came around with a response uh, to this e-cigarette crisis. Uh, and they issued a rule restricting flavored e-cigarettes. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what it does and what it or what it did and what it did not do. And, and continues to do. Um, so first, the FDA was following the data. They looked at the emergence of Juul and they banned flavored cartridge-based e-cigarettes. Uh, and there were a couple other measures that they took related to minors' accents and prioritizing uh, enforcement related to some, some of the more egregious flavors that were out there. And I have an, a picture there of a juice box um, an actual apple juice box along with an e-cigarette flavor that looks just like it and is called juice box. Uh, but the, 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 the most important piece of this FDA action, I think, was the ban on flavored cartridge-based e-cigarettes like Juul. Next. And then what it did not do was, again, I mentioned that it was following the data. Uh, what the FDA did not do was uh, follow the trend and kind of anticipate where the data might go. So if you look at number two here, you've got completely self-contained disposable products, i.e. Puff Bar. The FDA did not anticipate that products like Puff Bar, which had a lot of the same characteristics as Juul, uh, could emerge and replace Juul to a significant extent, or at least absorb a significant portion of the market. The FDA did not affect uh, these mods and tank uh, systems. These are products, and, and the, the rationale was that these are products that are used to an extent by adults more than by youth. And for that reason, they were left alone. And to my knowledge, that trend continues to hold true. I, I'm sure that there has been some youth migration to these products, but they still tend to be more popular among adults. And the FDA, even though it had mentioned that it might go towards, it might do something on menthol cigarettes and flavored cigars, it did not do it at that time. Subsequently uh, signaled that it would go in that direction. Next. Next. And lastly, uh, the FDA is now working on this pre-market tobacco application process. So it requires manufacturers to, including e-cigarette manufacturers, to submit these applications. Uh, all e-cigarettes are by statutory definition, new tobacco products that have to go through this. And the standard that the FDA is looking at is whether they're appropriate for the protection of public health. The two critical questions that it looks at in layman's terms, are how many tobacco users quit as a result of the product that's being looked at, and how many non-tobacco users start using the product because of its emergence. Um, next. What we've seen so far is that the FDA has authorized, uh, it's issued an order authorizing the sale of abuse tobacco flavored e-cigarettes um, these are not FDA approved products, they're FDA authorized products. Um, and it's issued denial orders for flavored views products. Um, FDA has issued statements saying that it's addressed 98% of applications, but it hasn't really told us that much about what products it has issued orders on. There, there have been a couple where it's actually reversed its decisions because it realized that it made a mistake or um, the, the, the type of evidence that it was looking for, it said in its denial order that that evidence wasn't there and it turned out that it was. Um, so the FDA was really overwhelmed with applications and they're doing their best, it seems, to try to get through them. But it, what it hasn't done is it hasn't 
answered or resolved the applications of some products that have really big market share. Uh, Juul has about 48% of the market, or at least uh, that, that's a, a recent data point on that. Um, Views uh, had about 33% or has about 33% of the market. So it's a pretty significant part of the, uh, the market that was decided. But I'm not even sure if that 33% is all views as opposed to views tobacco flavor. Um, so in short, there's a, a whole lot of e-cigarettes out there where the FDA has not issued, even though they may have answered 98% of the applications, that, that those 2% of the applications that they haven't answered comprise a significant portion of the market. So we're really in a wait and see period on that. So thank you very much. Great, thanks, Kevin, for the great presentation. Um, so following on the topic of e-cigarette policies, I want to use this opportunity to introduce how disposable e-cigarette brands are playing policy whack-a-mole and taking advantage of the policy loopholes to market their products in the US. Um, it's exciting to see a very heated discussion currently going on in the chat box about puff bars and disposable e-cigarettes. Next slide, please. So um, the, as Kevin just said, the, the FDA's 2020 flavor e-cigarette sales restrictions at the national level only apply to cartridge or paw-based e-cigarettes. So other types of e-cigarette products, uh, mainly disposable e-cigarettes, were exempted from the flavor restrictions. Um, and then since then, disposable e-cigarettes started to rapidly gain e-cigarette market share in the U.S. and have already taken over Juul as the most commonly used e-cigarette products among young people in the country. Next slide, please. So what are disposable e-cigarettes? As you can see, some of the packages and products and flavors shown in the slides. Disposable e-cigarettes are already charged and e-liquid is contained within the product. They are for one-time use only and they can be discarded after they no longer produce vapor. Disposables are often come with various flavors that are attractive to young people. Um, one recent study actually showed that just puff bars and similar products may already have over 140 thousand flavors. Oh, sorry, 140 flavors. Um, the packaging of many disposable brands show cartoons and fruit images that may already have very um, that may be very attractive to young users. So just like other types of e-cigarettes, the manufacturers of disposables are getting more creative over time. As you can see from the right side of this slide, um, the most recent disposable products have an airflow adjustment piece on top, on top of their products. Um, this is for consumers to adjust the flavors and hit from puffing the products. Um, they're more, they're much larger in size than the older versions of disposables such as puff bars, and it can be recharged when the battery runs out. Next slide, please. So the National Youth Tobacco um, Survey last year actually um, captured the changes of disposable e-cigarette use. As you can see from this figure, among US middle and high school students who used e-cigarettes in the past 30 days, most of them were actually using disposables. So over 53%, um, they're slightly more likely to be used among middle school students than um, high school students, followed by cartridge or paw-based e-cigarettes or tank or ma-based e-cigarettes. Next slide, please. Um, so in terms of the brands, as you can see, Puff Bar is leading the charts. Over 26% of young, middle, and high school students uh, who used e-cigarettes were actually using um, puff bars, followed by VU, Smog, Jewel, and Sorin. So Jewel is actually only um, uh, lower than 7% of um, young users are using this brand. Um, next slide, please. Um, so in terms of the flavors, although we have this national ban on flavor e-cigarettes starting from early 2020, we're still seeing that among middle and high school students who used e-cigarettes in the past 30 days, over 84% of them were using flavor e-cigarettes. So the commonly used or popular flavors were fruits, candy, mints, and menthol. As you can see, the middle school students are actually slightly higher in terms of their preference of flavor e-cigarettes than um, high school students. Next, please. 
So what about the situation in New Jersey? Um, as we all know, in April 2020, the state of New Jersey have restricted the sale of all types of flavor e-cigarettes, and including disposables. So the flavor ban in New Jersey is actually more stringent than the flavor ban at the national level. Um, our center conducted this online survey among young adults, e young adult e-cigarette users aged between 18 to 21, living in New Jersey um, just around end of last year. So it's very new data. And one of the questions we asked young adults is that, what impact has New Jersey's flavor ban had on your ability to obtain flavor vaping products? So from this question, um, as you can see from the figure, over 66% of our young adults e-cigarette users are reporting that there has been no change in how easy or difficult it is to get the flavors I like. 15% um, said they quit vaping, 13% said it is more difficult to get the flavors, but I'm still able to get them, and 4% said I'm no longer able to get the flavors I like. So from this figure, we can see that um, New Jersey state ban coupled with the national level restrictions on flavors, we're still seeing this very limited impact of those flavor ban on our young users flavor e-cigarette use. Next slide, please. So more data from the same survey among young adult e-cigarette users in New Jersey. As you can see, um, among the e-cigarette users, over 57% of them were using disp disposable products, followed by cartridge-based products such as Juul, and then followed by tank and mob-based products. Um, and in terms of the brands, just like the teenagers in the US, over 33% of them were using Puffar, uh, followed by Jewel and Lava. So I just wanna note that Lava is a New Jersey based brand. Um, it, it can be commonly find, found in the New Jersey's retailers, um, tobacco retailers or convenience stores or um, vape shops. And here are some examples of what Lava looks like. Um, they um, bring a lot of disposable brands um, and flavors. Um, some of them are actually the new, newly emerged um, uh, disposable products. And lastly, the young, among New Jersey young adult e-cigarette users, as you can see, the green bar, um, over 86% of young users were using flavor e-cigarettes. Um, the commonly flavors, just like teenagers, including fruits, mints, candy, and menthol. So as you can see from those data, the, the pattern of e-cigarette use among young adults in New Jersey really mimic uh, the patterns of the national uh, teenager use of e-cigarettes. And then the flavor, they're still predominantly using flavors given the state and national flavor ban. Next, please. Um, so last, sorry. <laughs> Lastly, I want to introduce. The, <laughs> sorry, if you could uh, mute your mic, please. That would be great. Thank you. Um, lastly, I just want to introduce this new tobacco free nicotine or synthetic nicotine claims that most of the or many of the disposable e cigarette brands are currently making. Um, so Starting from February 2021, many disposable e-cigarette brands, including Puff Bar, claiming that they're using tobacco-free nicotine or non-tobacco nicotine or synthetic nicotine. Um, these brands claim that their products are cleaner, purer, tastier, and have higher quality compared with e-cigarettes made with tobacco-derived nicotine. Um, as you can see from the, the figures here, those new types of nicotine are written in their nicotine warning labels um, on their products. The warning labels, including that those nicotine are not derived from tobacco or they're non-tobacco nicotine. Um, as Puff Bar's official website states, that Puff's nicotine-based products are created with tobacco-free nicotine. Our nicotine-based products are crafted from a patented manufacturing process, not from tobacco. So this new type of claim that many disposable brands are using is problematic because the FDA and local authorities can only regulate products that are made from tobacco-derived nicotine rather than non-tobacco or synthetic nicotine. So apparently Puff Bar and other um, disposable brands are taking advantage of this policy loophole and are trying to market their products as a non-tobacco product. Therefore, their products, by definition, may escape local and 
national tobacco control policies, such as the flavor ban, minimal age sales restrictions of 21, and even the FDA's pre-market review. Um, so additionally, our recently published study showed that this tobacco-free nicotine claim is actually causing young people to develop a lower harm perceptions towards puff bar e-cigarettes. So therefore, there's a possibility that disposable e-cigarettes may be used by more young people in the near future. Next slide, please. So now I want to summarize my presentation today by restating several observations. Um, disposable e-cigarettes have become most dominant e-cigarette type used among young people. And disposables often come with many use appealing flavors such as fruits and mints. They're easy to use and dispose and are highly concealable. Um, disposables are widely available at physical and online stores, even with flavor banning place. They often have um, appealing names such as Kelly Bars, Aroma King, and they come with colorful packages and with cartoon and fruit images that are very attractive to young people. And many disposable products actually contain higher levels of nicotine than other e-cigarette products. And finally, um, many disposables use tobacco-free nicotine claims that may reduce harm perceptions among young, young people about e-cigarettes and may escape um, many federal and local level tobacco control policies. Next slide, please. So with that, I thank you for your attention. Now I want to pass the baton to Dr. Mary Harifna. Thanks, Julia. Thanks everybody for joining today. Um, I'm gonna to be talking about one of the newer products available in the tobacco nicotine market, um, which is tobacco-free nicotine pouches. Um, next slide. Um, so I just wanted to get a sense of the level of awareness among the audience. And I saw some of it in that first poll about tobacco products being mentioned by your patients. But, how many of you today um, or before today had ever seen or heard of the following um, tobacco-free nicotine pouches? Some of the more popular ones are Zen, On, or Velo. So a pretty good portion of you. Um, so hopefully you'll learn some new information today, but we may also learn from you about um, how these pouch products are being, are being discussed in clinical encounters. So about 50-50 for now. Um, so, um, to give you a little bit of a brief orientation, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what kind of pouch brands are on the market um, and what we potentially will see in, in, the, in the next couple of years. Um, so next slide. So what are tobacco-free nicotine pouches? These are new tobacco-free oral nicotine products, and they're sometimes coined as modern oral nicotine by tobacco manufacturers. Um, they are very similar in physical form to Swedish snus. Um, which is also a pouched smokeless tobacco product that is placed between your upper lip and gum where the nicotine is absorbed through the mouth. They don't require any spitting or any refrigeration. Unlike snus, however, tobacco-free pouches don't contain tobacco leaf, but they contain nicotine derived from tobacco. Um, because they contain nicotine that's derived from tobacco, these products are categorized as um, smokeless tobacco products in the United States. They're not approved as nicotine replacement therapy or tobacco cessation aids. Next slide, please. By 2019, we had about five different tobacco-free nicotine pouch brands using tobacco-derived nicotine selling in the United States, um, including the popular Zin, which is sold by Swedish Match, um, On, which is sold by, by the Altria Group or formerly known as Philip Morris, Rogue, which is distributed by Swedish International. And then last year, RJR bought um, pouch manufacturer Drift and incorporated it into its Velo World Pouch line. Sorry, if you could please mute your line, thanks. Um, and so Drift is now rebranded as Velo Max, offering additional flavors and higher nicotine levels. Um, so as you can see, nicotine pouches are offered in a variety of nicotine content levels and a variety of flavors. In addition, all of these major tobacco-derived nicotine pouch brands have submitted pre-market applications to the FDA. And if the FDA authorizes these marketing orders, nicotine pouches would be allowed to stay on the market. And I should say that 
In addition to views, the FDA did authorize a marketing order for Verve, which is a discontinued dissolvable tobacco product that was manufactured by Altria, but um, Altria has indicated that they, what they learned from Verve has been included in their application for ON. Um, so it's just something to look for in the future is, you know, what the FDA's decisions will be on these PMT applications for nicotine pouches. Next slide. Thanks. Um, and then this is a, uh, a graph of smokeless tobacco unit sales in the United States. So again, pouches are reported as part of the smokeless tobacco product category. Um, this is national smokeless tobacco sales data for the last decade using retailer scanner data from the convenience store market for the U.S. Um, the smokeless tobacco product category, as you might know, is traditionally made up of moist snuff, chew or dry snuff, um, dissolvables, and now tobacco-free nicotine pouches. And so, again, you've seen some, there's clearly some growth here. Um, I do want to caution because in 2020, Nielsen did make some changes and modifications in their methodology. So I'm a little cautious about that leap between 20 and 2020, but there's clearly some growth in a market that's been fairly steady um, in the last decade. Next slide. Um, this is the smokeless tobacco uh, market by product type. Um, and so, uh, although traditional moist snuff is still the most popular form of smokeless tobacco sold, 2019 was the first time, probably since about 2005, um, that the market share dipped below 90% for moist snuff. And this is probably due in no small part to the really rapid growth of tobacco-free nicotine products. Um, the pouch category is denoted by the gray bar. Um, so we're seeing a, a lot of growth, um, particularly since 2019. Next slide. And Zin, um, which was the first pouch product to appear on the market, has really remained the brand leader since 2016. Um, but as you can see, its market share has significantly eroded in the last two years with the emergence of many other brands. Um, that said, the industry is very enthusiastic about this product category. Um, a brand manager for Zen Marketing was quoted in Convenience Store News as saying, most exciting, we have yet to find the ceiling. Zen continues to grow in the face of significant price competition and brand proliferation. Next slide. So what do we know about the product category? Um, the literature on the products is growing, um, but it's still pretty small. And the vast majority is definitely coming from the, the brand manufacturers themselves. Um, but I'm just highlighting this one figure from a paper from researchers at CDC that um, presented various product characteristics across several um, US brands and a couple of um, non-US brands. But the figure shows the levels of total and free nicotine found in some nicotine pouches by brand. Um, free or free based nicotine is the form that's most readily absorbed by um, it or in your mouth and can increase the nicotine uptake in your bloodstream. Um, so they found that for the products that they tested, there was a pretty wide range of total and free nicotine values, but they're fairly comparable in terms of nicotine delivery to other traditional snus and moist snuff products, which of course they visually rep resemble. Next slide. Um, and certainly some of these product similarities are probably gonna hold appeal for existing smokeless tobacco users. Um, but I think they also potentially see some advantages and some of those advantages are presented in the advertising claims made by oral nicotine products. Um, so what we know from the advertising of, of nicotine pouches um, from this recent study of marketing claims um, is that about 90% of these oral nicotine products are advertised as an alternative to traditional tobacco products like cigarettes, like smokeless, um, even e-cigarettes. 70% of the claims um, or of the ads claim that the product can be used anywhere. And about half of the ads um, contain claims that oral nicotine is spit-free, smoke-free, and doesn't contain tobacco leaf. Next slide. In addition, we're seeing um, a lot of crossover advertising of nicotine pouch products among combustible cigarettes. So remember, all of the major tobacco-derived nicotine pouch manufacturers 
also make other tobacco products. Some of them make cigarettes, some of them make cigars, moist snuff, snus. On the left is an example of an ad for on nicotine pouches, which was found on Marlboro's website in 2020. The product is advertised as a smoke-free alternative, a convenient way to find nicotine satisfaction while you're indoors and socializing. Clearly the images of, of young people socializing indoors. Um, on the right is an email from April, 2021. Um, which includes promotions for Camel's weekly coupon offerings and an invitation to explore the nicotine options from our friends at Velo. And the image shows a, per a person surfing, um, presumably an activity where you couldn't use a traditional combustible tobacco product. Um, and as the advertising mentions, Velo can be used anytime, anywhere. Next slide. So has the advertising worked? Um, what do we know about awareness and ever use and interest in these products? Not a whole lot. Um, again, there's really just not a lot of um, research on, on, on the topic yet. Um, what we found in a nationally representative sample comprised of US adult smokers is that by early 2021, about 30% were aware of these new nicotine pouch products a very small proportion had had the experience of ever using them, less than 6%, um, but about 16.8% of adult smokers expressed at least some interest in using tobacco-free nicotine pouches in the next six months. Next slide. Um, however, we did find variation by certain characteristics. Um, so for example, we found higher levels of awareness and higher levels of ever use among younger adult smokers. Next slide. We also found awareness, use, and interest in using nicotine pouches were higher among smokers who had reported ever use of smokeless tobacco. So not necessarily surprising given the physical similarities between these products. Next slide. Um, we also found smokers who reported having um, plans to quit smoking in the next six months were more likely to report having um, an interest in using nicotine pouches, at least relative to smokers who had no plans or more distant plans to quit. So again, the data in this area is, is pretty limited for now, but based on the sales data, you know, we can expect this product category to continue to grow and we're likely to see increases in awareness and um, use as well as interest in the product. Next slide. We also recently did a survey of US physicians um, and we asked them if their patients had ever asked them about tobacco-free nicotine pouches and about one out of 10 providers said that their patients had asked them about the product. And the percent varies somewhat by provider specialty. Next slide. We also asked providers to just qualitatively describe what their conversations were pa with patients were like. Um, and so this word cloud just highlights the popular words and phrases used and gives you just a quick, simple visual insight into what physicians are already hearing and talking about. And it's clear that patients and providers are already talking about these products um, and they're talking about them in the context of quitting and cessation. Next slide. Um, and so lastly, an issue that was already raised by Dr. Chen Sankey in the context of disposable e-cigarettes is that synthetic nicotine has also arrived in the nicotine pouch product category. We saw at least 10 synthetic nicotine pouch brands launched in 2021 alone. Many of them have higher con nicotine content levels than tobacco-derived nicotine pouch brands, and they too offer a variety of flavors. Um, so this is another sort of point to, to make is that we potentially would see additional brands popping up in the next um, few years, depending on um, whether or not the regulatory landscape really changes at all. Um, but something else to be aware of. Next slide. And so just in summary, um, tobacco-free nicotine pouches are um, clearly showing accelerated growth in the United States. Um, we see that marketing claims are very similar to what we've seen before for other non-combustible products. Um, awareness of nicotine pouches is, I think, still quite modest and ever use is still quite low. But again, this is something we want to monitor, um, you know, who's using them and how. Pouch use might be more common among ever smokeless users. That seems um, 
somewhat predictable. And then interest might be higher among those who are wanting to quit other types of tobacco products. And so I think providers should certainly be prepared to face questions from patients who might already be aware and using these products. And hopefully we'll have additional research in the next couple of years or sooner um, to kind of fill the gaps about how these products are being used and by whom. So I look forward to answering some of your questions, um, but I'm gonna hand the baton now to our anchor leg here, Dr. Steinberg. Hey, thank you, Mary. All right, so I'm gonna be shifting gears a little bit and talking not so much about products, but about um, how some of these electronic devices may be used for cessation as well as nicotine uh, perceptions and misperceptions. Next, please. So we're gonna start again with a couple of polls. Uh, for this one, I believe uh, we need to rejoin uh, as a quiz. Uh, so people can do that. You'll, you may be asked to enter your name, but you don't really need to enter a name. You can type in whatever you want um, to join the quiz. You can type blank, you can type whatever you like. And when, uh, when we have an adequate uh, number, I will uh, let Nicolette move us forward. Okay, so the first question in our poll, uh, nicotine by itself is a cause of cancer, true or false? And this is just a preview for some of the things we'll be covering later. Again, uh, whenever Nicolette, whenever we reach our so you see the majority of people say nicotine is not a cause of cancer, okay? And uh, one more poll question we'll move on to. Uh, in, in Which public health view best describes your opinion? So this is your opinion. We cannot allow young people to become addicted to e-cigarettes, so we should ban them from society, or we cannot allow current adult smokers to die from deadliest form of tobacco, so we need to make e-cigarettes more available to help those people stop smoking. I'll give folks a minute to respond. This one, it'll say there's a correct answer, but there's no correct answer to this one. There's no way for us to uh, not allow it to give a correct answer. This is more of an opinion, and we'll see what folks' opinions are about this. Okay. So three quarters of folks felt that um, we can't allow young people to become addicted, so we should ban electronic devices. Okay, so just again, just to frame some of this, we'll move on. Next slide. So I've been doing tobacco control uh, for almost 25 years now, and it was much easier back in the day. Um, all, all tobacco products were bad. Uh, just say no. Everything was black and white. Next slide. Uh, the concept of harm reduction uh, so that there could be a continuum of harm uh, made things more complicated for us, didn't it? So you have a, a wide variety of products and you see electronic devices falling somewhere probably between medicinal nicotine and combusted tobacco. So it does make things more complicated. Next. Um, as was pointed out by Kevin, uh, we know that uh, one of the main concerns with electronic devices is that young people are using them at high rates. So about a quarter of high school students are current users, and it's the most commonly used tobacco product. Um, when these products first came onto the market, at least for providers like myself, we saw them as a potential for a less harmful alternative for current adult cigarette smokers to switch to. Unfortunately, we don't see adult current cigarette smokers using electronic devices at the same rate as young people. So that is obviously concerning if that's the goal of these products. Next, please. Now, one of the things I'm gonna talk about is nicotine. Nicotine, as you all are aware, is a chemical. It's the chemical in tobacco that makes tobacco so addictive. Nicotine activates the reward pathway in the brain, this nucleus accumbens, ventral tegmental area. It's a common pathway for other substances of abuse, and it causes release of dopamine, which is the neurotransmitter that mediates this reward effect. Next, please. Okay, when we're talking about treatment, 
Um, Evidence-based treatment is based on what we found useful. So we have our U.S. Public Health Service Clinical Practice Guidelines. We have many publications out there, studies that show what's effective to help people quit. Next. And we know that quitting by and large uh, best is best accomplished with a comprehensive approach, including behavioral counseling, social support and follow-up, as well as pharmacotherapy. Next. Our seven FDA-approved pharmacotherapies currently include five nicotine replacement products, three of which are over-the-counter and two of which are by prescription. So it's clear that at the heart of tobacco treatment are uh, nicotine replacement products. So that's why nicotine is very important in this discussion. Next, please. This is a slide bar from one of my colleagues at NYU, uh, Susan Urban. So this shows that nicotine is one of the chemicals found in uh, electronic aerosol, but there are other chemicals found in electronic aerosol which can cause potential harm to the user. Next, please. Now, one of the, one of the um, reports that we use as a basis for our knowledge about electronic devices is the National Academy of Sciences report, which was published um, uh, in 2018. Next, please. Just want to go through some of the conclusions from that body. Um, nicotine from electronic devices is highly variable and can be at, at times comparable to that found from combusted cigarettes. There are other potentially toxic substances, but they are found at much lower levels than found in combusted tobacco. Next. Regarding harm reduction, someone who completely switches to electronic devices will most likely reduce their individual harm compared to if they continue to use combusted tobacco. Now, this does not include dual use, it's complete switching. And we don't yet know what the long-term health effects of the electronic devices are. Next, please. What about electronic devices in terms of cessation for combusted tobacco? In, at, at, in 2018, the National Academy of Sciences concluded that there was insufficient evidence that there were randomized trials of electronic devices for cessation. However, next, since that report came out, there have been a number of new studies looking at this issue. This is a randomized trial from the UK, which compared electronic devices to nicotine replacement. Next, please. And found that the one-year cessation rates were 18% in those who were randomized to the e-cigarette arm compared to about 10% in those randomized to the nicotine replacement arm. Next. So even though abstinence rates were higher in the e-cigarette group, um, e-cigarette use was more common at that one-year mark. So 80% of people in this trial were still using the e-cigarette products versus only about 9% of people who were randomly assigned to the nicotine replacement arm. And the limit, one of the limitations of this, again, e-cigarettes, electronic devices, have not been proven to be safe. Next, please. So e-cigarettes as a cessation tool, um, we have more data that shows that um, uh, there, there's growing evidence that nicotine-containing e-cigarettes are beneficial. They can lead to cessation, both compared to NRT as well as compared to non-nicotine electronic devices. So we have mounting evidence that these products could be effective for cessation. Next. So the hope for electronic devices is that they could be present a less harmful alternative to combusted tobacco for current adult cigarette smokers could be coming to fruition. Now, this does not take into account all of the public health issues that still remain regarding e-cigarette use among young people. Next. So it's important to recognize that nicotine is not a harmless chemical in itself. Nicotine is a stimulant. It's a catecholamine. It can increase blood pressure slightly and pulse rate. It can cause constriction of blood vessels. Um, it does not seem to contribute significantly to atherosclerosis. Um, it can affect reproduction. So in pregnant women, can affect fetal organ development, especially neurologic development, and can also affect neurologic development in young people. There is no conclusive evidence that, e that nicotine causes carcinogenesis or cancer in, a, in humans. Next. What about the general population's perceptions about nicotine? Next. So we know that from surveys that about half of people in the population report nicotine as a cause of cancer. Next, please. And we know that those, res those results are most likely found in people age 65 and older, in people who are non-white in terms of race, and who have less than uh, either high school education or less. Next, please. 
In other studies looking at young people, like the Truth Initiative, two thirds of people believe that nicotine causes relatively or very large health risks, and about 55% believe nicotine caused cancer. Again, certain populations had more of these uh, beliefs than others. Next, please. And in the PATH study that many of you are familiar with, next, we see that depending on the source of nicotine, um, nicotine is described as either very or extremely harmful. 75% of people believe that nicotine from cigarettes falls into this category, but 45% of people believe that nicotine from NRT feel is that same way. Next. Um, so in general, two thirds to three quarters of people believe nicotine is responsible for much of the harm related to tobacco products. And these misperceptions can vary depending on the group. Next, please. Now, what about physicians and healthcare providers? Next, please. We did a study uh, that looked at e-cigarette perceptions and beliefs as well as practices among physicians. Next, please. And in the wave one of that study, about a thousand physicians from various specialties were asked about nicotine. Next, please. They were asked uh, the extent to which nicotine on its own could contribute to the development of the following health problems. Next, please. And we found that over 80% of physicians reported that nicotine, they strongly agreed that nicotine contributes to cardiovascular disease, COPD, or cancer. And only about a third of reported nicotine contributes to birth defects. Next. These, uh, these results varied by specialty to some degree, as well as certain characteristics. Next, please. And it was interesting that the misperceptions for uh, nicotine exist for physicians uh, in terms of nicotine causing cancer, somewhat at higher rates than even seen in the general population. Um, one of the questions could be, one of the issues could be the wording of the question. We did a follow-up study that asked specifically, regardless of its addictive effects, could nicotine affect these diseases? And there was still a trend in the same direction. Next, please. So in summary, there's growing evidence that e-cigarettes could be a potential aid for cessation of combusted tobacco. Misperceptions of nicotine occur both in the general population as well as among physicians. And it's especially important to understand misperceptions around nicotine because not only is nicotine replacement a very critical part of tobacco treatment, but also the FDA's regulatory strategy may include low nicotine products in the future. And it's important for healthcare providers and the population to understand the specific risk that nicotine poses in these products. Next, I believe I will turn things back over to Heather now. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Seinberg. Um, I do want to take this moment to thank our four presenters for the information they shared today. We are going to move on to a Q&A session. We do realize that we are running out of time. We will be staying on the line for a few moments to try to have a nice dialogue about the questions that you put in the chat or that you've emailed over to myself or Nicolette. So if you can stay with us, we're, you're welcome to continue along with us today. Um, in the meantime, I am going to go ahead and drop an evaluation link into the chat. So if you need to get going, please consider filling out that evaluation because it does help us understand what you think about this talk and also provides us with some information about future programming. So I'll drop that link in the chat in just a moment. Um, we are going to go ahead and move into our Q&A session. So um, I'm just going to get rolling right through some of these questions. So we did have uh, one uh, emailed question. So how might the FDA or states handle regulation of tobacco-free nicotine pouches and some of these other products in the future? Kevin, Mary, Julia, Mike, you all alluded to this. Have any thoughts on that? Sure, uh, just a quick uh, comment. The, F <clears throat> the FDA cannot, it, it very likely cannot do anything uh, in terms of regulating tobacco or nicotine that is not derived from tobacco. The FDA's jurisdiction is established by a law that Congress passed in 2009. And unless Congress amends that law to broaden the definition of tobacco products subject to its jurisdiction, the FDA is unlikely to be able to do anything. The, re the only reason I hedge is because it's conceivable that the FDA may try to stretch its jurisdiction. Frankly, I don't think that it uh, is likely to come up with uh, a legally viable way of doing so. So I think they'd have to wait for Congress to do something and that's probably unlikely. Do any of our other speakers wanna make a comment? Mary? 
Um, yeah, I mean, I will say that obviously uh, states can regulate these products as well. Um, and in fact, in some states, synthetic nicotine is regulated because the definition includes um, nicotine no matter how it's derived. Um, you know, that said, the FDA can take action on tobacco derived nicotine products. Um, they could control the nicotine levels, they could ban flavorings. Um, those are all potential things they could do. Um, I just don't know that they've indicated there's any sign of that coming. Um, but certainly states can go above and beyond what the FDA has done. Um, and there is a there was one previous legal analysis that indicated that um, syn synthetic nicotine could be regulated as a drug by the FDA rather than as a tobacco product, and that there could be legal standing to regulate it in that way, um, depending on its intended use. Excellent. Thank you, Mary. All right, so I'm going to shift gears here because we have several people asking questions about the health effects of the tobacco-free nicotine and synthetic nicotine. And I think Dr. Steinberg did allude to this, but Mike, would you mind just restating um, what we know about the health effects of non-combustible products out there? Yeah, so I, I would say, again, in general, these are generalities, that nicotine is uh, the addictive chemical in tobacco, but nicotine is not the chemical that causes most of the tobacco caused disease. That being said, it's not without uh, effects. It can affect cardiovascular, pulse rate, blood pressure. What we know most clearly is nicotine is something that you, you don't want to give to pregnant women unless you have to. And, and I'm not saying that you can't use nicotine replacement in the sense of a pregnant woman who continues to use combusted tobacco as a less harmful alternative. Um, but we know that nicotine can affect the developing fetus. Um, but but I think nicotine and and also other people have mentioned the effects of nicotine on developing brain in young children. So uh, nicotine is without harm. I think clearly if you're talking about nicotine from non-combusted tobacco as well as from nicotine replacement compared to nicotine and the 7,000 other chemicals in combusted tobacco, there's no comparison in terms of the relative harms but I don't think anybody should come away with this thinking that nicotine has absolutely no physiologic effects. Excellent, and as a follow-up to that, Mike, in the tobacco treatment program, such as the quit centers here in New Jersey, um, are you recommending that smokers use e-cigarettes to try to quit smoking? That's a, that's a great question, comes up all the time. By and large, what we would say is we recommend that people use evidence-based treatment and uh, the seven FDA approved pharmacotherapies have the longest track record of both effectiveness as well as safety. They're large, they're increasingly covered by uh, insurance. So the cost could be less for those products. So we would recommend that people use the products that have the longest track record for effectiveness and safety. If someone comes to us and says, I am going to use an electronic device or I am going to use a uh, nicotine containing pouch product, we don't slam the door in their face. We work with them, but we make sure they understand the relative information that we have about the FDA medications and the information that we have about the uh, other tobacco products that we've been talking about. Excellent. Thank you, Mike. There is a quick follow-up question here in the chat. It's a little off topic, but um, do you have any updates about Verenicline Chantix right now? Is it still on the market and available as an approved cessation medication? Yeah, it, it's on the market. It's available, but it is under a voluntary recall, so you may have a tough time finding it. Um, I would just check different pharmacies, and it's in, a, in my opinion, it's okay to use the generics that can be available from Canada. Excellent. Thanks, Mike. And also want to uh, shout out there to Michelle Kennedy, who dropped the New Jersey quit resources in the chat box, so it's tobaccofreenj.com. Uh, thanks, Michelle, for doing that. Um, I'm going to turn to another question here. We have several people asking questions about the decline in youth tobacco rates. Um, I think both Mary and Kevin had put some information up about that. They're wondering if factors like COVID and students not being in school and things like that may have led to some of these decreases, some of these numbers we're seeing. And folks would like to know if you have anything to add to that, any comments about it? Um, well, I'll say that, yeah, the, the, the 2021 
National Youth Tobacco Survey does show a decline in e-cigarettes, but there is a tiny footnote in that MMWR that indicates oh, yeah. the prevalence of e-cigarette use was higher among those who took the survey at school versus those who took it at home. Um, so I think I we don't that, understand. That earlier, that no, sorry, was you could just mute your, your, thank you. Um, so I, I do think we don't know yet what 2022 will show. Um, if schools are now back in person, it seems more likely that some users may have, you know, sort of found their source of, of e-cigarettes again. Um, and so I think it remains to be seen, but I would expect an uptick just sort of based on, on what we've seen so far, but something to look out for. Excellent. Thanks, Mary. And Kevin, how about you? Have anything you'd like to add? Yeah, just to put uh, an additional uh, point on what Mary mentioned, you know, she mentioned a discrepancy between when people were taking or were completing surveys at home versus at school. And so there, there was, because of COVID, because of hybrid learning situations and at home schooling, there was just a difference in how the data was collected. So it's, it's hard to, it's not quite an apples to apples comparison. And, and that's why a longer period of time, more data in the future will help us to understand this uh, challenging period a little bit better. Excellent, absolutely. Uh, I'm gonna turn to Puff Bar. So Julia, I know you gave some really good information about that. We have a lot of folks out there in the chat interested about these products, how much they cost, where can they be purchased? Are they purchased as a single unit or in a pack? And um, also if Kevin and Mary wanna also jump in on that question as well. Yeah, so I think it comes with single unit in a pack, um, in a high volume and then really ranges from um, very low cost, $5 to like $12, depending on how many, you know, products are in, in the package. So it really ranges a lot. And those newly emerged products with adjustable flow on the top, they might be more expensive than the older versions of a puff bars. And there's also a lot of copycats out there online, sold online, puff bar co copycats. They might be cheaper than the, um, the real versions of puff bars. Excellent. Yeah, we did have somebody in the chat mention that as well. So we need to be on the outlook for that. Mary and Kevin, anything you'd like to add? I'll, I'll just uh, point out that Puff Bar as a company is a really uh, unusual and kind of shady uh, country, uh, company. It, it, was, it was selling its product. It started to get a big uh, stake of the market. Uh, there's some interesting... Uh, reporting on this if you haven't seen it yet and then the the company sort of went offline and there was apparently a change of ownership but there's not a lot of public information on this and it came back online and when it came back and started selling its products again and then in the interim the illicit market for puff bars uh took off but when the so supposedly legitimate puff bar came back on the market that's when they started claiming that their product was synthetic nicotine not derived from tobacco and there and and even being pretty uh bold about it and saying and therefore the fda can't regulate us you you might think that they would have tried to keep a low profile and instead they're advertising themselves practically as the company that's not regulated by the fda so and, and there's still um not a lot of information about the owners or about how the company operates. Very interesting. All right, and now I've got a, a question probably for all four panelists. It's a, it's a long one, so let me read it. What caused the explosion of e-cigs and alternative forms of nicotine products? Was it just the creative marketing of Juul or were we primed for this type of product to move into our society? It's been floating around since the 80s. Why not a sooner explosion of use? I, I can jump in and give an early answer, and I'm sure other folks will have some ideas on this, but I, I, I kind of question some of the facts in the question. E-cigarettes really, as, as they exist now, didn't exist until about 20, uh, just before 2010. And then they started to get some market share in the US, 2011, 2013 or so. And, and that's when we had these first and second generation products. There were lots of flavors, they were becoming popular, but they but the explosion that I was talking about earlier didn't really happen until Juul hit the market. So it wasn't quite flavors because the flavors were already there. What took it to a different level was the nicotine salt, which really uh, 
made them more addictive and, and a more efficient product at delivering nicotine. And that coincided with the marketing that really targeted the younger populations. So there's, there's a couple of different contributing factors, but those, that's, I, I see it as uh, flavors and the existence of the products, helping them to establish a little bit of a foothold between about 2010 and 2015 or 16, and then Juul taking it to another level after that. Now we have copycats that are trying to build on Juul's formula for success. I just want to add to that. I think the design of Jewel and all those um, new e-cigarette products are really um, easily used by our teenagers at schools because they're very like sleek design and very easy to hide. And you teachers and parents can't even tell their their kids or students are using it. So that really feed into this whole interest of using e-cigarettes. And the kids consider it as a very cool device to use. Um, they're copying each other like you you know, like it's a very cool behavior. So the norm changes over time as well. And just to jump back to one early part of the question, like the question references these products that were out there back in the eighties. There were a couple early products, prototypes that tried to create like the non deadly cigarette from back in that era. And they just weren't uh, uh, consumer friendly. People didn't find them uh, enjoyable and they never got any market share. In fact, tobacco companies that tried to sell them realized that it wasn't a very good product and took them off the market themselves. Excellent. Thank you so much. In the interest of time, I think at this point, we're going to close out our Q&A session for now. Um, anybody that does have any additional questions, please drop them in the chat or you can email them to Nicolette. We are going to create a Q&A document and we'll be able to send that out to everybody at a later time. Um, also, we do really want to thank you all for your participation today. I did drop the evaluation tool into the chat box, but I will go ahead and I will drop that again in a moment. But before we get to that, we have one more Slido quiz we'd like you to take. Nicolette, you can go ahead and launch that one. I think folks should already be logged in and ready to go. So the question is, what topics from today are you interested in learning more about? And here is a list of topics that we might be able to go ahead and turn into another talk for the future. So folks could go ahead and tell us what interesting things that you heard about today would you like to learn more about? I'm gonna give it one more moment. And then Nicolette, when you are ready, you can close out that poll. Excellent. Very good. So we appreciate everybody going ahead and filling out that poll for us. Like I said, we'll take this information into consideration when we think about developing out some additional educational opportunities for everybody. Again, we want to thank you all for your participation. There is information about the evaluation. It is another QR code. So you're invited to go ahead and just aim your smart device at that QR code to go ahead and take that evaluation for us. I'm also going to drop that into the chat for you as well. We are interested in hearing your feedback about today's presenters and also do really want to learn from you about topics that you find interesting and you would like to learn about. So please go ahead and fill out that evaluation form as soon as you can. We will be sharing out the video recording and other materials via email. Just give us a little bit of time to go ahead and wrap up that video and do what we need to do to work our magic on it. And then we'll be sending it out to you via email. If you have any additional questions, please send them to Nicolette or myself, and we will be happy to uh, write back to you again in touch with you about whatever things that you might have questions about. At this point in time, we're going to go ahead and turn off that recording. We're going to thank you all for your time today, and we hope you have a great afternoon. Thank you all for, for participating. Bye-bye.